Good. <laughs> no, it's okay. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, the good thing about having the one year delay is that it actually allowed me to do some research on what I had proposed to talk about last year. <laughs> <laughs> you know how it is, you propose to talk about something and you think it's going to be finished. So now I actually have something to tell you. Um, I do apologize to those of you who were in, in Palermo because it's very similar to what I told you already in Palermo. So you could take that opportunity to have a nap, I guess, <laughs> because visiting the sites probably it's a bit short notice now. Anyway, so it's about exploring these new random matrix ensembles. It's, it's a very much work in progress and it's quite uh, speculative. So you're going to see that along the way. So um, this is joint work with my student Steve uh, Dombe and Matthew Taylor and my, and my daughter. <laughs> she, she only does the very simple two by two case, which is why I'm only focusing on this today. Um, Okay, so the idea is it's five o'clock and it's a long day, okay? So I'm trying to keep it simple. Um, and we start out with the question what random matrices actually are. Is it Emma? Ah, here we are. So obviously, it's the, the name gives the hint. Um, random matrices are matrices, which are random variables. Or if you want to put it even easier, it's just matrices and all the elements are random numbers, okay? So why should we be interested in that? So they've been used in many, many different areas, but they, but particularly popular, Van Dyson and Wigner actually speculated that in quantum physics, if we have sufficiently complicated systems and we can't really do any calculations of them, that was particular in the nuclear, in the theory of nuclear physics, um, the idea was that maybe we can describe them by random matrices. Okay, and there was a really big. Um, hype in that whole field actually when it was connected to quantum chaos with the bohiga stanoni schmidt conjecture, which is still a conjecture, but there are many different, uh, many, many, many examples where we know that that's true, which connects um, quantum chaos to random matrices. So the idea is, and many of you will have heard about that, that if you have a quantum system whose classical counterpart is chaotic, then we often expect that the spectral fluctuations, that is the um, for example, the, the mean um, distances between eigenvalues, that they behave similar to some certain random matrix models. And these random matrix models will have to be Hermitian. So there are counter examples. There are some systems for which that is not true. And there are some systems um, for which, which are integrable and still they have these other statistics. But on the whole, there seems to be a very, very strong link between classical chaos and the quantum system having spectral features which look like random matrices. And in particular, um, Dyson actually came up with three particular classes of random matrices, which are the Gaussian symmetric, unitary, and symplectic ensemble. I'm going to tell you a tiny bit more about them later in case you haven't heard about them. And it turns out that there's are three different um, ensembles. And depending on the time reversal symmetries of our quantum system, um, one expects them to behave according to one of those. So now, obviously, we are all interested, or many of us at least, are interested in PT symmetry. And PT symmetry as a generalization of closed systems, for example, or in gain-loss balance systems. And it's a natural question to ask what would happen if we have, for example, a PT symmetric quantum systems with classical chaotic counterpart. What would be the random matrix expectations for that? So we're asking about a PT symmetric random matrix theory. That has been asked before, um, and we're adding a new proposal to that. So the outline for my talk is that first I want to tell you a few things about some standard random matrix ensembles. Basically, I review in two slides some um, features of the Gaussian ensemble, so Dyson's threefold way I've been mentioning before, um, show you a few spectral features, and then I also talk about the Geneva ensemble that some of you may or may not know, which in fact um, is PT symmetric, and I believe that Joshua is going to talk going to <laughs> more about the connection uh, tomorrow. And then I will come to something which is actually not related to random matrices, but it's um, the foundation of our new proposal for PT symmetric random matrices. It might be something that's interesting for some of you in different contexts, and that's um, the proposition that a PT symmetric matrix can be represented by what I call a split Hermitian matrix. And I come to explaining to you what that is. So if we use 
um, instead of complex numbers, so-called split complex numbers, or instead of quaternions, so-called split quaternions, it turns out that if we build matrices out of them which are Hermitian, then they are equivalent to PT symmetric matrices in some certain sense. So I will use this then to define a new class of Gaussian ensembles of random matrices. And so far, we've only in detail analyzed the two by two case, which obviously is where you start. It's not where you want to end up because you're usually interested in large matrices in this business. Um, but I will show you some analytic results um, for the two by two case. And then I will relate that back to the Geneva ensemble because it turns out that only one of the ensembles we're proposing is new in that sense. So one of them is very closely related to an existing one. Okay, so let's start out with some standard random matrix theory. I've <coughs> been mentioning that um, <coughs> there's what we call Dyson's threefold way. Um, in conventional quantum systems, of course, we have the Hamiltonian to be Hermitian and having real eigenvalues. And it turns out that there are these three different classes um, of symmetries, um, which are deeply related to the time reversal symmetries of the, the system we look at. And in fact, Dyson came up with, there, there are many good reasons for that, I'm not going to go into the detail, but with these three different classes saying that if you have real symmetric matrices, these represent systems which are invariant under orthogonal transformations, of course, you know that, and that's um, related to systems which have a standard time reversal symmetry where t squared equals one. Then if you have complex emission matrices, they are actually, um, invariant under unitary transformations, as we know. And in Dyson's classification, it turns out that they're actually related to quantum systems where which do not have any time reversal symmetry. And then there's the last class, which we don't usually use that much in quantum mechanics, but it's one of Dyson's classes, um, which is the class of, I call them quaternionic Hermitian. They're usually called self-dual matrices, so where we have quaternion entries, and um, these are then invariant under symplectic transformations, the quaternionic version of unitary transformations. And they um, belong to systems with this unusual time reversal symmetry t squares to minus one, which is usually connected to a spin degree of freedom. It doesn't have to so be. It yeah, it has karma's degeneracy as well. But I'd say in solid state physics, we do use this a lot. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yes, yeah, you do, but in, in not many not quantum not physics. Yes. <laughs> In many, and in, 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 in random matrix theory, it's, it's one of the standard ones, but in many other quantum contexts, you don't see it that much. You mainly <coughs> work with these here. Okay, so um, what we then do, or what Dyson then does, is actually define a Gaussian probability distribution on the space of these matrices. And there are many good reasons to look at Gaussian distributions. And one very good reason for that is the fact that if the matrices get very large, um, different distributions actually yield universal behavior, and then you might just as well use Gaussians, right? Because they're easy to calculate with. But there are many, many deeper reasons to go, uh, use Gaussians. And so that was introduced by Dyson in the 60s, and the spectral features of these matrices are very well understood. And let me just give you a very simple idea on how you construct them. So if you feel really bored now and you have a computer with you, you can do some experiments with random matrices. <laughs> so <laughs> the way to construct them is you just take any matrix and you take all the elements randomly distributed normal variables over either real complex or quaternionic numbers, and they're completely <coughs> independent. But then you want to that to be Hermitian, so you add it to its adjoint and you divide by two, right? Then you get a Hermitian matrix. So that's the practical way to actually construct that ensemble. In equations, um, this is related to a probability distribution on the space of matrices, which is proportional to e to the minus, and then there's a factor between these different ensembles, trace of h squared. So it's also a Gaussian on the space of matrices, really. And um, these are called the Gaussian orthogonal, unitary, and symplectic ensemble because of their invariance classes. Okay? So the spectral properties are very well known analytically for arbitrary matrix size. But what people are mostly interested in is the large limit because we're interested in the behavior of systems <coughs> with many eigenvalues. What's easiest to calculate, of course, is the two by two ensemble. And I just show you a picture to get you into the mood of what the sort of things we're looking at will be. So one typical thing you look at is actually the one level distribution. So this is where we start from. So we have a probability distribution on the space of matrices. 
And then what you want to calculate is the probability distribution of the eigenvalues, okay, the joint probability distribution. And one thing that is very easy accessible, for example, if you plot it, you don't look at the joint probability distribution of all eigenvalues, but you make a histogram of all the eigenvalues, right? In statistical terms, that's the one level um, density or distribution. So for it just tells you how many eigenvalues are in a certain, certain region, approximately. So we have these three different ensembles, and in these pictures, I guess I took um, 100,000 or 10,000 or maybe fewer matrices, and you just make a histogram, and then there are also analytic distributions. You can see that um, the main feature of the unitary and the symplectic ensemble is that you get a bimodal structure and a dip in the middle. So what one looks at most, because that's what actually has a universal behavior, is the level spacing distribution. So that's now the probability distribution. You order your, your eigenvalues, and you look at the distance between neighboring eigenvalues but you renormalize such that the mean distance is one, okay? And this is a measure of the fluctuations of the eigenvalues around this sort of mean behavior here. And the lucky thing is that um, there's the Wigner surmise, which turns out to be true, uh, that in the limit of large matrix sizes, we get the same behavior as for two by two matrices, which is very nice. So which is why these two by two results are quite important. And the thing to take home from these, if you haven't seen, is that in comparison to just random numbers, where you get a Poissonian distribution of the, of the gaps, in other words, random numbers cluster. So if I just look at random numbers, for example, in the interval minus one to one, I get lots of them being at the same points. Um, the eigenvalues of random matrices repel each other. So the probability that you get that same eigenvalue twice in two by two matrix, but even a larger matrix goes to zero. And depending on these different ensembles, you get different repulsion. So for the orthogonal ensemble, the one of real symmetric matrices, you get a linear repulsion. Um, the unitary ones, you get a quadratic, and the symplectic one, you get a quartic repulsion. Okay, so this is sort of the things one looks at. And this is um, what you often compare to the behavior in an actual quantum system that might have a chaotic counterpart, these fluctuations around the mean value. Another ensemble, which is um, physically less used in quantum mechanics, but um, has been introduced similar time as the Dyson ensemble, is the Ginebra ensemble. And this is actually a much simpler ensemble. It's just, um, you just take the random matrix itself without any symmetry constraint. So if you just take a matrix A and you put all the elements to be independent random variables, then you get the Ginebra ensemble. And um, there are three different ensembles again, the real, the complex, and the quaternionic Ginebra ensemble. But the one that I want to tell you about in a few words is the real Ginebra ensemble. So this is just matrices with real elements, and each of the elements is a normal distributed random variable. So if you want to write down the probability distribution in the space of matrices, it looks very similar to the Gaussian, to the um, Dyson ones, but you get H, H transpose here, which is not the same as H squared anymore. And these are still orthogonal and uh, invariant under orthogonal transformations. And let me point out that these matrices are actually PT symmetric because they're real. So they obviously have a real characteristic polynomial. So all the eigenvalues can either be real or complex conjugate. And this is a harder ensemble um, to look at. So uh, Geneva studied it or introduced it in the 60s or 70s, but only in the last 10 years or so people actually managed to calculate many of the um, properties of the probability distribution of these systems. So the one level density is known and spacing densities are known, but there are higher order correlations you want to know that are still challenging for that. And here I just show you a little picture of the eigenvalues. And what's quite interesting about this ensemble um, is that in the imagined real part here, that there's a huge probability that the eigenvalues are real. So this is again two by two, I have to admit. So there's a huge probability you can calculate the value. It's one over square root of two. And then there are some complex eigenvalues. There are such little bumps here, which in that sort of resolution, you don't actually see very well with the light. So there's a little bump here, and there's a little bump on the other side of complex conjugate eigenvalues. Okay, so this is a well-known ensemble as well. That's the limit uh, of 
This is a two by two. two. In the limit of large matrices, um, there's still a finite probability to have real eigenvalues, but it drops when n goes to infinity. So it actually does go to zero. Yeah. So it's, um, for two by two, it's, it's this large probability otherwise. It's non-zero, which is in itself, I think, surprising, because if I ask what's the probability to have imaginary part five, it's obviously zero, right? It's a point of measure zero, but there's a delta function coming into the probability distribution, which makes it prone to have real eigenvalues, in fact. Well, but the measure is probably zero in the n infinity limit. In the n infinity. It's the one of the square root of n uh, yeah. uh, fraction. Of yeah. Or what? Yeah. A real. A real. A real. A real. A real. Yeah. 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 It's, finite n infinity. it's still, for, for, a, for a finite n, you still have a finite probability that the eigenvalues are real. But, you know, it's just a curious thing. Um, Anyway, so what about PT symmetric matrices, random matrices? So we're all <laughs> interested in PT symmetry here, and there's an example. Here so you see Carl in his PT symmetric unbroken face, and here he is in the PT symmetric broken face. We see PT symmetries everywhere. Um, so there have been several attempts to introduce PT symmetric random matrices because, you know, that's a natural question if we have lots of PT symmetric experiments. Other things, it's one of these quantum classical correspondence questions. So um, most of them are related to or restricted to two by two matrices. And um, there are some other ensembles by Pato and others um, who are also for n by n, but they're very precisely constructed um, things. They're not like a new universality class. And the big problem is actually. Uh, how to parameterize a PT symmetric matrix of size n. And I don't know whether many of you m may or may not have encountered that problem before. So if it's a two by two one, it's still okay, but even there it's a bit challenging. But if you want to parameterize a five by five PT symmetric matrix, it gets a bit difficult. And usually <laughs> you have to pick a certain PT symmetry and then you make choose the matrix to be uh, invariant with respect to that. Um, we actually use a different definition of PT symmetry that Philip and Carl, who sit here in the front, so if you have questions about it, you have asked them, um, <coughs> came up with in 2010. And they've been showing, correct me if I'm saying something wrong, that um, complex matrices which are PT symmetric are the same as complex matrices with a real characteristic polynomial. So um, if you have a PT symmetric matrix, you can easily show that you can bring it to a real form and then it has a real characteristic polynomial. I think Carl did that in a paper <laughs> before <laughs> that. And then you showed it the other way around as well. So if you have a real characteristic polynomial, you can construct a PT symmetry for that. So this is the um, definition I'm going to use in the following. So now the challenge is to parameterize PT symmetric matrices, to parameterize n by n matrices, which are complex but they're constrained to have a real characteristic polynomial. So the first thing you can do is you can count how many parameters you need. So there are many different ways you can count that. So an easy way is to say, all right, I have n squared parameters, uh, two n squared parameters in my complex n by n matrix. Right? And then I have n constraints, which actually come from all the coefficients in the characteristic polynomial. And they are all independent and they're all linear. So they all reduce. Um, the dimension by one. So we have a two n squared minus n dimensional family of PT symmetric matrices for an n by n matrix. But the challenge is to parameterize that. And I think Ching Hai, where's Ching Hai? Is there? <laughs> You've been doing the parameterization for two by two, <coughs> right? And then you started an explicit one for three by three, which I think actually had less parameters. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's a bit challenging. So which I think is one of the main obstacles to construct um, the random matrix theory then, because you need to find a natural way um, to actually construct your ensemble. So here comes in the, the second part I want to talk about, which is the um, interpretation of a PT symmetric matrix as a split Hermitian matrix. Before I can talk to you about split Hermitian matrix, I have to tell you a tiny bit about split complex and split quaternion numbers. They're actually quite simple. So the split complex numbers, in a way, are um, something like a hyperbolic version of complex numbers. Um, so it's just a number with two real components, x and y. And we have this imaginary unit, j. 
but instead of squaring to minus 1, it actually squares to plus 1. Okay? So we define the conjugate in the same way as we usually do, x minus j, y, so you turn the j sign around, and you can represent these things in real 2 by 2 matrices, in the ring of real 2 by 2 matrices, which is very useful. So if you have multiplication or um, addition and subtraction of these split complex numbers, it's the same as working in the ring of these matrices. But what you can see, which is why I call them the hyperbolic version, is that they get an indefinite norm. So if you define z times z bar as the norm of this um, complex, split complex number, it is x squared minus y squared, so it can be either positive, negative, or zero. And um, the ones of um, norm zero lie on this line here, and the others lie on hyperbolas and parabolas. Um, which is why they're a bit like a hyperbolic version. And in some ways already that sort of reminds of some of these indefinite norms coming up in PT symmetry, but that's just similarity. Um, what about split quaternions? Of course we all know the, the actual quaternions that Hamilton introduced where you have a number with four components and you have this i, j, and k that fulfill the famous commutation relation or the famous relation i squared j squared k squared is minus one it's equal i j k and they have their famous commutation relation which we all know very well from the Pauli matrices which are a representation of them. So at the same time or quickly after Hamilton introduced his quaternions so James Cockle who looks a bit angry here <laughs> I don't know whether that's a general feature but just um <laughs> so he introduced his split quaternions. Yeah, some people are unhappy with split quaternions, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> so the split quaternions are just um, the split version of the quaternions similar to the split complex numbers. So except what we do now is the i still squares to minus 1, the same way as it usually does, and then the j and the k square to plus 1, and the i, j, k relation is replaced as well. So in some directions it looks um, um, hyperbolic and others it looks elliptic. But there are other possibilities. You could have taken two of them. <laughs> yeah, there are others. I think they're all known as hypergeometric um, yeah. numbers. There are others, but not all of them have, um, you know, they have varying degrees of nice properties. So this here seems to be a natural one because it, in, it encodes both the complex and the split <coughs> complex numbers uh, as a special case as well, which makes them quite nice. So if you said i and k to 0, for example, you get the split complex numbers. If you set that 2 and z3 to 0, you get the complex numbers. So it has these different directions. And um, again, we can represent them in matrices. I, now we have complex matrices here, and many of you might be familiar with the complex 2 by 2 representation of quaternions. It's very similar, so there are some signs turned around. And the norm of these is again indefinite and you can see that there are two positive signs and two negative signs. So it's, it's also there's some relation to SU22 if you wish. Oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> so again, you can, why you can think of the quaternions as rotations, these also include Lorentz boosts. Okay? So these are the numbers and this representation will be quite useful. So now what we argue is that they have something, you can build matrices out of them and they might have something to do with PT symmetry. So to talk about matrices, we do need something, to talk about Hermitian matrices in particular, we need something like an inner product space, but that's quite easy. So if we define the um, inner product on split quaternionic vector space just the same way we would naively do it, so we just take component-wise product and we conjugate one of the components, and then we can define an adjoint of a split uh, quaternion matrix just the same way we usually do it. It turns out to also be as a matrix. This adjoint is then just the transpose and the split quaternionic conjugate. Okay? So now we can call matrices, which are the same as their adjoint, split Hermitian. And it turns out that these matrices, they are invariant under unitary transformations similar to, to Hermitian matrices, it's just normal unitary transformations. Okay? <coughs> but they have quaternionic, split quaternionic on entries. If we take matrices which only have split complex entries and there's a subgroup of these, then they're going to be invariant under orthogonal <coughs> transformations. 
And it turns out, now you can just count, that the space of split Hermitian matrices has also two n squared minus n dimensions, just as the space of PT symmetric matrices. So that actually already tells you that these two spaces are isomorphic. Um, but also, if you take these two by two matrix representation to define eigenvalues, you have to be a bit careful with eigenvalues in these things, even with quaternionic matrices, because not everything commutes. Okay? But a very safe way to do that is to just use this two by two representation of each of the elements. So if you have a n by n matrix, you represent it by two n by two n complex matrix. Then you can look at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and you find that the characteristic polynomial is always real. And it's always doubly degenerate. This is similar to Kramer's degeneracy in normal quaternions, but it also happens for the split complex numbers. So you get, you find n eigenvalues for an n matrix, and they're the um, roots of the real characteristic polynomial, <coughs> and the dimension of these matrices is the same as right for the. So yeah? In the definition of split Hermitian yeah. matrices, so you have these split complex numbers. Yes. So I have to keep track of which row it is. Because a number there it, with an i, it could have to somehow keep track of the, uh, or, or it's all re reduced to real normal complex numbers using two by two, so they yeah, end everything is multiplied. You can complex. you can do that. I mean, at the at the moment, the way we do it is we represent an n by n split um, quaternionic or split complex matrix as a two n by two n real or complex one. But yes. Yes, but um, I think it's just the crutch. I think you can just directly work with these um, split complex and split quaternic numbers. But it, you're slightly on the safer side if you mention <coughs> things like eigenvectors with the split quaternions. Right. can get tricky because, you know, you can't, yeah, they don't commute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and in, in that way, you're on the safer side. But I think, um, so most things, um, if you just look at the 2 by 2 or 3 by 3 or 4 by 4 examples, you could just as well directly work with a split complex or split quaternionic numbers. But they're Hermitian, and that makes these here special. So if the matrices we defined out of them were not Hermitian, then this the characteristic polynomial would not have to be real, and um, we would not have this degeneracy. So we would get artificial um, eigenvalues sometimes. But this makes everything well behaved, and it's very, very similar to the situation in quaternionic matrices <coughs> in standard random matrix theory. Okay, and these arguments are actually um, what makes me think or claim that these split emission matrices, definitely they are PT symmetric because they can be interpreted as matrices with double degenerate eigenvalues with a real characteristic polynomial. And because of the number of parameters being right, we, we find a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. So there's, of course, an argument on how, what is the nicest one-to-one -one correspondence. If you give me a PT symmetric matrix, how do I write it down in, in these numbers? And for some cases, I do know the answers. For others, we're still thinking about the best way of doing that. But the number of finite dimensional parameters is right. And so we can find a counterpart for each, each PT symmetric matrix there. So now. Um, there, there's another thing which is, I think, quite interesting, but we're still thinking about. It seems that these split Hermitian matrices are PT symmetric matrices that come, um, that already know about the PT or CPT inner product. So, in contrast to, for example, the eigenvectors of the real Geneva ensemble, the eigenvectors of these split Hermitian matrices belonging to distinct eigenvalues, they are always orthogonal with respect to this. Um, new inner product or this, this split inner product. Okay, so they're the matrices which already come with this in this new inner product space, which is an interesting question also. How does the, the sort of CPT product actually map to the inner product in here? And what we haven't found is actually the CPT product because this product that we're using, the inner product on the split quaternionic space, is non definite because the norm is indefinite could be negative or zero, which is very much like the PT product. Okay. But these are all subtleties. So now if we just assume that this is, is a good way of defining PT symmetric matrices, or I at least if we accept that these matrices are PT symmetric, then of course we can go and we can do <laughs> random matrix theory with them. And the easiest way to do that and they, it turns out as you go along that there are actually lots of good reasons coming up to do it, but the, 
the, e the one we took to start with is that it's the most natural thing to do, is that we just construct them in that simple way again. So we take a matrix built out of split quaternions or split complex numbers, and we add it to its adjoint to make it split Hermitian. Right? And again, in this here, in this A, we just take Gaussian distributions and independent variables. And if we do that, we can actually translate into the probability density on the space of matrices. And we have these two different cases. So here I took all these normalization constants. That you didn't see them in the, in the Hermitian case. It's just constants, as you see. Um, and it's e to the minus trace h h transpose for the split complex numbers. That looks very much like Geneva. They are defined on different spaces, though. Keep that in mind. And then for the split quaternions, we have to, if we just translate that, what we get is h plus h, what we call i here. So it's transpose and complex conjugation, but not quaternionic conjugation. So the j and the k don't change their sign. The i changes its sign. But both exponents are positive. Hmm? Yes. Yeah. So this is the thing. So there's an alternative one you could define, where you just take trace h squared, which is invariant under you know, split unitary transformations, but that's not a probability distribution. Whereas this is, it's just produ uh, produced in that way. So if I write it in elements, it's just e to the minus square of each of the elements of the matrix. Again, the normal one, the diagonal is weighted different from the off-diagonal. But it's just the same in that sense as the standard Gaussian ensembles. And if we write them like this, then this one here is invariant under orthogonal transformations, and this is invariant under unitary transformations, the standard ones. And that reflects um, some <coughs> symmetry of the matrices as well. Kay? So let me give you these two by two examples, because it's, it's much easier to see. So if I write a two by two split complex emission matrix, I can write it in this way. So every two by two split complex emission matrix can be parameterized in this way. I have four real parameters. Okay, and I just call them lambda one, lambda two, delta, and gamma. And then I have the j here, which squares to plus one. So if I translate this probability distribution, that's what I've been saying. That's a very natural distribution now. So it's just the Gaussian in lambda one, lambda two, and the delta and gamma. And because of this um, construction, very similar to the um, GOE or GUE, you get a factor of two here. So this, in fact, um, looks almost identical. This looks identical to the GUE, in fact, except there would be a, an I here in the matrix. So things are slightly different. What is the measure? One to one. What is the power of one to It one? is just the elements. It's D lambda 1, D delta, D gamma. No, no. D. When, when you multiply it by DH, yes. when you want to separate yeah. eigenvalues from yes. angles. Yeah. What is the one? Is it the one to one? It's the same yeah, it's, this, it's so very similar. You divide by square root of two. Yeah. Yeah, it's very similar, but let me show you what we did in here, because actually the reason that we look at 2 by 2 first is that we actually do the 2 by 2 in a pedestrian way. Okay? So we just manually transform from these guys to eigenvalues, because for that we can just do that. There are four, four real parameters, yes. but according to your general formula, yeah. It was two okay. square yes. minus yes. N. Yeah, that's the split. Yeah, that's the split quaternionic one. So we now distinguish two cases. I should have made that a bit more clear. And I I mean it seems that they're a bit like the GOE and the GUE in the standard one. So we can either have split complex emission matrices or we can have split quaternionic emission matrices. And the split complex ones, they're just um, um, isomorphic to real PT symmetric matrices. Okay, which also have four parameters right, in, in two by two, where the split quaternionic ones are then similar to, to complex PT symmetric matrices. So this would be that. And it turns out that this here is actually a way of rewriting the Geneva ensemble. We only figured that out after we looked at the distributions and they looked so similar to Geneva. Um, we realized that if you write this in its, two by in its four by four real form, then you get such a matrix, you know, where all these things are uh, Gaussian variables. And that doesn't really look like the Geneva, but you can find an orthogon orthogonal transformation which does not depend on these parameters here, which brings it to two copies of the Geneva ensemble, um, which is the Geneva ensemble, so it's lambda 2, lambda 1, and these numbers. And they're all 
if you see that they were Gaussian variables with the same width. So this here is actually now just a matrix with four Gauss independent Gaussian variables of the same width. And this here is the transpose of this matrix, which is quite interesting. So you had the Geneva and its transpose. And I don't know, probably it <laughs> has something to do with PT symmetry, but, but we don't fully understand all that yet. So the same thing holds in, in N by N. So you can find a transformation from, from this split complex emission matrices <coughs> in this representation um, to two copies of Geneva ensembles. So there's a difference between them, of course. So the spectrum is the same, but there's a difference because the eigenvectors of this here are quite different from the eigenvectors of the Geneva ensembles. Okay? They have the PT symmetry built in, and they don't. They're non-orthogonal. So in that sense, actually, here we'd be done because we can just read off all the known results from Geneva, but we also take it the other way around. In fact, it turns out that when we do it, things the pedestrian way, but even if we do it for n by n, because of this similarity to the GUE, actually the, the way we calculate the, the probability distribution for the eigenvalues here is as simple as doing GUE almost. Not quite. There's differences when the eigenvalues are complex conjugate, whereas the Geneva is a very hard ensemble. So we believe that actually, even though this is a known ensemble, it might be a new way forward to, to calculate things in Geneva. Oh yes, yeah. I think there's a lambda two. He, yeah, it's a lambda two here. Yeah, sorry, that's a typo. Yes. <coughs> yeah, that's a typo. Thank you. Yeah. So if we do the same for the split quaternions, we get the six parameters now, and we just get a Gaussian in all these six parameters. So what's the joint probability density of the eigenvalues, the one-level densities, the level spacings? The level spacings we define for real eigenvalues. Otherwise, you, you can also define it so we calculate it for different dif distances between complex eigenvalues, of course. But these are the things we calculated now. And I'm just going to show you the results and show you some pictures, but let me say a few words on how we do it. As I said, in this one here, we just take the pedestrian approach. So what we do is, we take these parameters, lambda 1, lambda 2, theta, mu, mu, and sigma. But of course, because <laughs> it's a 2 by 2 matrix problem, or 4 by 4 if we go to the other thing, we can, ex of course, explicitly calculate the eigenvalues as a function of these parameters. Yeah? And it's just the normal square root type functions you get. So what we do then is we do a transformation from this capital lambda 1, lambda 2, theta, mu, nu, and sigma to our eigenvalues theta, mu, nu, and sigma. And then we integrate out theta, mu, nu, and sigma because we're not interested in them. And it's a bit harder to integrate them out than in the GUE because we have to take care that by definition all the parameters are real. So we have slightly different integration boundaries from the GUE which will give us slightly different results. But this is just the pedestrian way of doing it. And you get obviously you have to integrate over four things in a row over complicated regions. And the integrals get very, very long. But luckily, they all shrink down again. And my students are quite good in this. So they did these 20 substitutions and dug up integral tables. So they actually solved these things. For the um, split complex emission ensemble, this is the result for the one level density. And this is the picture. The picture looks familiar because, as I said, it's similar to the Geneva picture I showed you earlier. So you get some error function. Um, in the imaginary part and some distribution here. And then you get this delta function of the imaginary part is zero. So this here is the distribution along the real eigenvalues. And the probability that the eigenvalues are real, I also told you already, is one over square root two. So this here is just the probability for the real eigenvalues only, the one level probability. So this is what you get if you plot a histogram of the eigenvalues. And the red line is the um, analytic result. And you can see that this looks very similar to the GOE, to the Gaussian standard ensemble of orthogonal invariant matrices, which is well known from the Geneva, that if the eigenvalues are real, <coughs> it actually looks almost like the standard Gaussian ensemble. But what's interesting to note here is now we have split complex numbers, but there's an equivalence to this Gaussian ensemble of real numbers, not, not the one of the complex numbers. Okay. Um, and then the split, that's still the split complex emission ensemble. So these are just the eigenvalues which are complex. So I took out the big peak of 
real iris, you can see a bit better what goes on here. So it's just this double peak structure, and it's basically just the error function and this Gaussian in the two directions. So for the split quaternionic case, um, we also do the calculation, and there we are not aware of any similarity to any known ensemble. At least we haven't found any. So we could try to do the same trick as with the real one, but it brings us to nothing we recognized. So here you get a slightly longer expression for the one level density along the real line. And you also have a finite probability that the eigenvalues <coughs> are all real. It's a bit smaller than the one for the split complex ones, but not much smaller. So here we have no idea what happens when n gets large, uh, only numerically so far, because we only start looking into it. The other one, of course, we know the answer from the Geneva ensemble. But it seems to be, the scaling, if you look at it numerically, seems to be quite similar. So then, uh, just the real ones, you might now think, well, that looks a bit like the GUE, in fact, but it's quite different. So you have a um, um, much lengthier <coughs> expression here. So there are some similarities, but in the end, it's, it's not the same expression. But it looks fairly similar structurally, the one level density. Then um, along the complex... Yeah, but it's there's the first term and the okay, last term. Yeah, there's <laughs> things. No. It's e to the minus two lambda squared. Yeah, at lambda equals zero. Yeah, yeah. So everything is is nicely behaved. Uh, maybe there's, a, but I don't think there's a shorter way. Maybe there's slightly shorter way, but they're definitely different. Okay. Um, along the complex direction, it doesn't look so different from the split complex uh, Geneva, but the expression is actually much simpler, so there's no error function here, but it looks very, very similar. So that's for the complex eigenvalues. And then you can also go and calculate the level spacing distributions, assuming you have real eigenvalues, then it makes more sense. Um, so for the eigenvalues which are real, you order them and you look at the distribution of nearest neighbors. In the split complex case, obviously you get GOE because that's what you get for real eigenvalues. And in the split quaternionic case, you get something which doesn't look so much different. But I plotted the GOE result in comparison here, just to s let you appreciate that it looks a bit different, at least. But the expression is, is quite different. There's a constant A in here, which is just um, a function. It's just a number. So there are lots of square roots of 2 and pi's and, and these sort of things in there. But basic is, again, some error function. Some this here is a positive e to the a s squared, but it um, it all works out <coughs> nicely, so it does go to zero, and it's a nice probability distribution. All right, so this is what we have done so far, and I think um, I'm coming to a summary here. I can obviously tell you what we will be doing. Um, but to summarize first, um, the Hermitian Gaussian ensembles, as many of you know already, describe universal features of quantum systems with a classically chaotic counterpart. And what we are been conjecturing is that split quaternionic Hermitian matrices are related to PT symmetric complex matrices, and we use that to define a new class of PT symmetric random matrices. <coughs> and um, there's, of course, a question mark here is that a new universality class? We don't know. Of course, you have to look into, first of all, we have to calculate n by n systems more than numerically. Um, but then, of course, you have to look into examples of PT symmetric chaotic systems and see how their spectral features behave before we can say anything more. And that's actually all I wanted to tell you, so thank you for your attention. Understood, but I got the impression that you defined the PT symmetric matrix as a matrix with a characteristic, real characteristic. Yes. But then, what? Any, any I think any matrix with real values. Yeah, that's the, the real gene. That's the real gene. Yeah. PT symmetric it has some requirement of PT symmetry, not no. any. No, it isn't. No, no, it doesn't. So that's in a in a but paper I mean, that yeah. That yeah, 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 that you can yeah. ask uh, Carl and Philip because they wrote a paper. Any with yeah. real values yes, because you can always find the p. <laughs> you can always find the pt <laughs> operator for that. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, yes. But, uh, you can always there define there a pt operator for that. Well, you, can you can even go back to Wigner. If you do that, you can find the 
just take an energy E and you have T symmetry, then you have an energy E star, which means that the characteristic polynomial is real. That, that's basically. So the, the way they, I mean, yeah, I mean you can say more about it, but the way you can prove it is then that you obviously you need to define what your PT operator is. But you can, you, can, you can construct a PT operator if you have a matrix with the real characteristic polynomial. And it depends on what you say. I mean, obviously it's not parity in the sense of x to minus x. Well, there's no x, it's a matrix. No <laughs> but <laughs> but it's, it's, yeah, it's an antilinear symmetry. Sorry, I, I didn't get your <coughs> question. <coughs> oh, I was just waiting for the Okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, as I said, for example, um, it depends on what you're looking at. I mean, there are these, they, they just have different features. So I don't restrict them, but I, we can calculate this, for example, is the probability distribution of eigenvalues conditioned on being real. Right? And this is the probability distribution of the rest of the eigenvalues. But that's, that's a very natural thing. In fact, you have to do that even for n by n in the Geneva. As far as I know, you always have to when you calculate, you have to calculate it that way anyway. So the you usually, have you have to calculate it this way anyway. Usually you look into the case where the eigenvalues are real, or where they're complex conjugate, or in these different combinations to... Geneva, to I mean you ju just take the matrix, you define the measure over the matrices. Yes. And then you separate it into polar to the composition. You will have Van der Mond to some power. You will have some other values. Yeah, but there so always is a distinction. which is not eigenvalue. And there's always a distinction at the end in these distributions on whether the eigenvalues are real or whether the eigenvalues are complex conjugate. You just go to Ginebra's paper from 1960. Oh, there, but there's no real Ginebra in there. He didn't solve the real Ginebra. Okay. So <laughs> so no, no, but look. He didn't okay, solve this, the real Ginebra at all. To <laughs> I want to ask, so yeah. I want to give myself yeah. the permission to ask a question. Uh -huh. So uh, I wanted to ask you, first of all, about your yeah. split uh, complex and split yeah. quaternionic. How do you, is there a way to define the measure uh, in, of integration, the H, the H, uh, or the H, I, what you call it, in a way which separates eigenvalues from diagonalized? Well, if, th if there was, then, if we, there we had so <laughs> if <laughs> then we had solved the n by n problem. So that's okay. obviously something we're looking into. They, they, I mean, we, we're thinking of it. The problem is, so the invariant under uh, unitary and orthogonal transformations, respectively, but they don't diagonalize them. So um, they are also invariant under, it seems, the split version of unitarian thing. But again, only if the eigenvalues are real, you can use that to diagonalize them. So you have to make a distinction again. In um, if the eigenvalues are real, you can you can use one thing. If they're complex, you use a slightly different method. But which, as I said, also also in uh, Geneva, uh, also in Geneva is complex ensemble. Not all complex matrices are diagonalizable. Yeah. But any complex matrices could, could be uh, decomposed in a unique way. As yes. Could be the well, different ones. There's the sure so sure decomposition they usually oh, use. Okay. So. Uh, so he carefully uh, yes. goes, the parameterizes all the com uh, complex matrices, uh, defines the measure, he starts yeah. with a van der one to the po power yes. four, integrates uh, the mm -hmm. similarity transformation and some upper diagonal matrices, yes. and then the four, van der one yeah. to the four, drops to the Because the, the probability, two. this is why he could deal with complex and quaternionic almost, okay. and he also uh, introduced the real one, but he couldn't deal with it in that way because there's a probability of having real eigenvalues, which doesn't happen in the others. The probability is zero, right? If you have the probability of real eigenvalues, you know that, as Edelman and others and Sommers did later, you do have to distinguish between these two cases just as a matter of parametrizing and finding the normal forms. It's just, I mean, you can still do it, but, yeah. And I think that the thing is that here the normal form is easier because it is diagonal, so you can diagonalize it because they, they have the split emission property. So uh, this is why I'm saying probably there's an advantage over the, the normal non-hemission matrices where you have to find some other way of doing finding a normal form which often takes either the sure form or other upper triangular forms. So um, 
here it seems that you should be able to use the degrees of freedom of the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues more in the standard way. But this is all work in progress, so be, be still looking into that. But obviously that's, that's a crucial step to go from the probability density of the matrices to the ones of the eigenvalues by having, because we because can't do that, what we did here in 3 by 3. Yes. You cannot com compute the uh, probabilities. But if I take this Ginebra mm -hmm. ensemble as representative ensemble of PT yeah. uh, symmetric mm -hmm. matrices, something similar to Dyson ensemble, yes. then the result is that I'm always in the broken VT phase. Yes. So then it has no no, you're, you're not always, because as I said, I'm always not always, result. because there is this also. crucial finite. No, uh, probability that you have it. No, it yes. in the so large in M, the large M, M it goes to zero. Of of yeah, yeah. Well, which which is still non-zero. I mean, no, I'm that, well. It, they, we've been discussing a lot about exceptional points before. They have a lot of physical meaning, and they have measure zero. It's um, completely <laughs> impossible that I find them if I pick a random matrix. So I wouldn't argue that something which is stochastically or statistically of measure zero doesn't have physical well, meaning. But, I mean, here we have a wide parameter range where you have only real eigenvalues, right? So yeah. So somehow we really want to distinguish those two cases even yes. statistically. Yes. It's not the same as just a, you know, a point of measure zero like an exception no. point. No, it isn't. We know that you know, when you study things that are measure zero but you're able to tune to them, yeah. then they become interesting. Yes. Yes. Like, so like, like finding all, all Hermitian complex admission matrices that yeah. So yes. somehow, I mean, I'm just I'm supporting Boris that yeah, we I know get that, that the, the um, physical PT systems tend to have two domains. Yes. You go over a wide parametric yes. range, you're only real, and then another wide range, well, you're infinite. Range it, it, range. it depends on which you're choosing. There I are agree, loads of PT symmetric PT. systems that you choose, which from the beginning have you know it depends no, on how you pick your parameter, you which you are, you are broken. But he likes non-generic. <laughs> yes, but what I'm what I'm saying is that in fact it isn't of measure zero for finite <coughs> dimensional matrices. There is a finite probability yeah. that they're real. Measure zero in which <laughs> you know. Space. I mean, yeah. because the thing is, obviously, if n goes to infinity, it does go to zero, but it's not a strong zero, you know, as many of these other effects. And for two by two, yeah. for example, it's it's quite high. It's actually more likely that they're real than that they're not real. So. Oh. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> she has a very strong opinion about yeah. uh, split pattern. Uh, I, ju uh, I just wanted to make one comment yes. about uh, the importance of uh, Gaussian matrices and yes. why they are so natural. And this uh, has to do with an idea by Roger Balian. He, uh, he defines uh, for any sampling space, any probability space, you can define the entropy or the information. Yes. And then uh, if you assume that your eigenvalue, that your uh, uh, random variables are IID independent and yeah. identical. And uh, you just enforce some mild constraint like saying that the variance of all these variables is known. And then you minimize the, the information subjected to that constraint. That's what you get. You get yeah. the, the there are many more. I mean, we also know that you get them if you do a random walk on the space of matrices. And the, uh, what I find more convincing even is the fact that they, they represent the same invariance class as, as the matrices do. There, there are many good reasons to, to look at Gaussian. Okay. Any other comments, questions, complaints? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's thank the... <laughs> <laughs>